Hi, everyone. We're just going to wait a minute or two for the uh, attendees to start to get in. Uh, we'll start briefly, shortly. All right, it looks like uh, we have quite a few, so I'll, I'll get started and let the remaining uh, attendees start to accumulate. Uh, just so everyone knows, uh, my name is Johnny. I'm an admissions counselor here at Stony Brook. Uh, so welcome to our faculty workshop for computer science with Professor Richard McKenna. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can submit them using the Q&A feature. Uh, my colleagues and I will be in there. And then if there's any questions that we want to hold uh, for the panelists, we'll share those uh, later on. Also, the event is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. There will be a link provided to you in a, in a follow-up email if you choose to see it again. Um, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Richard McKenna, who will be leading our presentation today. Uh, Richard earned his bachelor's degree in industrial engineering from the University of Texas at Arlington and his master's degree in computer science right here at Stony Brook University. Uh, Richard is the undergraduate program advisor in the Department of Computer Science, and he is the founder and coordinator of the Game Programming Specialization and the SBU Game Programming Competition. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Richard and we can get started. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen and do a little presentation. Let me know if anything goes awry at any point in time. Okay. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about computer science, a little bit about our university, a little bit about our department, then a little bit about in sp specifically undergraduate research. If at any point in time you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them um, through the online form that we have. And we have a couple of students here who are doing research projects with me that I'd like to introduce. Uh, Charlie Minoni and Jason Wong. Now they are both working on research projects with me and they are happy to answer any questions from a student perspective. I'm happy to answer questions from a faculty perspective. And then we have other um, people here who will answer questions from an admissions perspective. So we have all three perspectives for you. So this is me. Um, I thank, thank you for the introduction just a moment, moment ago. Um, if you are interested in knowing a little bit about me and some of the things I'm gonna talk about, I have my website here, which I can uh, show you a little bit more in just a moment, because I'm gonna just introduce you to some of the undergraduate research projects that I'm engaged in. Uh, so you're welcome to go to that site and look around, and I'm gonna get into some of those things in just a moment. As mentioned, I teach undergraduate courses. Uh, I'm on the faculty, um, I'm on the um, curriculum committee, so I help determine what is in our undergraduate courses. I supervise a number of research projects, and then I'm involved in um, game programming specialization in the competition. The competition has been going on now for 16 years. And this last year, despite COVID, it was really great because we got to have a number of alumni out on the West Coast working at different companies participate as judges. We, we always have alumni judges and we got to have, I think almost 50 judges last year because they could join us virtually. So I would encourage you to go to my homepage and I would also encourage you to go to this games page. Uh, they have similar links, www.cs.stonybrook.edu slash tilde games or slash tilde richard. You could also Google me and find me quite easily. I think just Richard McKenna, Stony Brook, and you'll find it. And you'll find links to these things online, right? So I'm assuming that you know what Stony Brook University is, but just quickly in case you don't, uh, there are four flagship campuses in the State University of New York system. And Stony Brook University and the other three, see if you can guess what they are. Binghamton, Albany, Buffalo, right? And we are a public university, of course, for the state of New York. And our computer science department, you know, we think that we do great work here. 
and we think that we have very high standards and we think that we have really outstanding students. And that's one thing I always tell students is that you want to be in an environment where the other students are outstanding. It encourages you to do better work. It encourages you to take your academic career more seriously. And it also provides the opportunity to have great teammates and do great projects. And I feel very lucky because over the years I've had so many great students who have taught me so many things. I mean, we have a couple of students here, Charlie and Jason. I learn as much from them, maybe more as they do from me. Um, and I have leaned on them for a great many things, including Jason right now is writing a grant proposal for myself and another faculty member. We're writing it all together. Um, and Charlie is managing a server for some of the research projects that I'm engaged in. So um, there's a lot of responsibility given to these undergraduate students who have earned it. And I, I feel like I'm very lucky to have had many great students over the years. And again, uh, I feel like these are people that if you're around them, you feel inspired, they come up with great ideas and, and go on to great careers elsewhere in all sorts of different um, types of careers. I mean, I have here some sort of humorous references. One of my ex students is a professional wrestler. I didn't include the UFC fighter, but I could have. He's also one. Um, but lots of students who've gone on to work in, in uh, industry in all sorts of different companies on the East Coast and on the West Coast. I always tell students who have an interest in computer science, uh, you know, pick your major very carefully. You really want a major that suits you in three different ways, right? You want something that interests you something that will give you skills, right? And then something that will help you pay your bills, right? Meaning that there's a demand for those skills, right? Um, and certainly, you know, the old expression is make your vocation your vacation, which means if you can find a discipline that you enjoy, uh, then you'll, you'll want to do good work, right? And I think that that's something in common with many of our students. Many of our students, um, they participate in things like hackathons and they participate in their own personal projects, not just because they have to, but because they feel inspired to do so. They have an idea. They wish to make that idea a reality, things like that, all right? So you really do wanna pick a major that interests you that will give you certain skills that, um, you want to have, right? Um, think of college as an opportunity to become skilled in something. And then again, paying your bills is important, right? And so you wanna be careful to choose majors, I think um, that will help you in that regard, right? Let's see here, how do I undo that? There we go. All right. Now, I also tell my students, and maybe this is, <laughs> um, a little much, but I do tell them this, is that in terms of paying bills, there's one of two ways to pay bills. The first way is that someone is paying you because you are uniquely good at something and it earns them money, right? That's if you're an employee, right? Uh, we, we assume that your role at a company or a university or a school or a government institution or research lab or whatever, that your position is doing, is adding value to that institution, to that company in such a manner that it is making them money, all right? And that is why they employ you. The second possibility, of course, is that you are creating things for yourself and that will pay bills by earning you money, okay? And the idea here is, of course, creating your own technologies, licensing technology, starting a company, things like that. And we've had a great many students over the years who have done things like that, who have started companies, who have made applications that have become popular, things like that. But these are basically the two ways to pay bills, unless you can inherit something or win the lottery, which I have not yet figured out how to do. Certainly, if you go to... Um, job sites like Monster. I mean, you wanna see the types of positions that people are looking for, 
for after you graduate, right? I mean, what kinds of things are people hiring for? What are the skill sets that people are looking for? There are also all sorts of labor department reports and things like that, forecasting the next 20 years or something, what sort, sorts of jobs are going to be in demand, things like that. Uh, looks like we do have a question. Let's say I want to pursue a career in robotics. Would majoring in computer science benefit me in any way? The answer to that is definitely, um, I'm actually advisor for the robotics team here at Stony Brook. I'm also advisor for my son's high school team uh, where they do first robotics, although it's been a bit on hiatus because of uh, COVID, but uh, both teams have programmers. Uh, and in, when I was an undergraduate student, uh, I did robotics programming at my university. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you're going to be getting a robot to do something, you need a whole wide range of skills, right? You need mechanical engineers, uh, you need um, computer scientists, you need programmers, you need a lot of different types of people. So certainly computer science is one of them. And, you know, we do have an active robotics team here, which competes in a number of different uh, competitions every year. What programming languages do most students who major in computer science learn? So here at Stony Brook University, we use Java for the introductory courses. We also use Python for introductory courses. So those two, you will definitely get experience with and then you will get a lot of JavaScript, all right? That's the only standard that we have. It's the standard for the web, right? So JavaScript is arguably the most important language out there these days. I mean, there's backend servers and front-end browsers that use both of them, all right? I'll come back to some questions in just a second. Uh, in terms of the difference between these things, you know, there's another one maybe I should put on here, which Jason knows about, which is applied mathematics. There is some overlap between all of these fields, right? Computer engineering, computer science, and information systems. So if you're confused about these things, because we have all of these majors here at Stony Brook, I'll just give you a brief overview. Computer engineering is engineering the hardware, meaning the actual physical device, uh, how to design the chipset, the CPU, the RAM, how these things fit together, instruction set architectures, and things like that. Computer science is programming primarily in high level programming languages, meaning you're writing software, you're creating solutions to problems with software, all right? So you're coding um, things in very specific programming languages, using software libraries, doing all sorts of different things like that, all right? Information systems is, uh, has some overlap with computer science and that information systems students are required to take certain computer science courses. They are primarily involved in using technology effectively for business purposes. So a systems administrator, a security administrator, a network administrator, uh, those types of things, and, and some other things as well. So that's the difference between those things. Um, again, just to clarify, so certainly we are talking about um, primarily about computer science. But if you have an interest in applied math as well, again, um, Jason can answer your questions as well because he is on both tracks, actually. In terms of what computer science is these days, it is a, an ever-expanding field. I mean, it expands and expands and expands and expands and expands, right? I mean, we have all manner of different things that we study in computer science now that we didn't study 10 years ago, certainly not 20 years ago. Certainly a big thing these days is machine learning, which is part of artificial intelligence. Another one is um, data science, okay? And data science is used for a million different things in analyzing data to glean information from it. Uh, but there are many other fields in computer science that have their own technologies and algorithms and approaches and methodologies, including robotics. Somebody asked about robotics before. So this is a very large field. I mean, certainly you can look at all the classes that we have and 
I think one of the benefits of our department in particular is that we are a very large department, right? Um, and to some degree, that is a benefit, I would say, because we can offer a very wide range of courses. We have more than fa 50 faculty members. Um, there are other universities that uh, you may know that may have 15 faculty members and they can't teach nearly as, as many different varied courses as we can, right? So I do have a question for the gallery. Let's see if anybody can answer this question. What do all of these things have in common. In fact, Charlie and Jason, let's see if any of you can answer this question. What do all of these things have in common? I'm assuming They're someone all... at Stony Brook had something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I know the uh, is... I know the little I, anime. I like that. Lady. I like that. That's not the answer, but I like that. Jason, mm -hmm. you have a question? I was about to say they're all pretty big companies. Uh... <laughs> or at least the people who developed these programs are all pretty big. Uh, I think I know. Yeah, so all these, the people that made this, they started in like college or something, didn't they? Absolutely, they were all yeah. students. Every single one of these was started by students. So Google, right, a couple of graduate students, Sergey Brin, Larry Page at Stanford University. Facebook, we all know Mark Zuckerberg at, Berg at Harvard. Portal was an undergraduate team making a game at DigiPen, Yahoo, a couple of students at Stanford, Reddit, I believe the University of Virginia, I think so. Microsoft, of course, Bill Gates was, I believe, a freshman at Harvard and Paul Allen was at a university in Washington. Shutterstock, I put that on here, that is John Oringer, he was one of our students. If you're wondering what this is, this one you might be unfamiliar with, this is RenPy which is one of the primary platforms for making visual novels. Those of you who are interested in visual novels and things like that, um, some of the visual novels made with RemPy have sold in the millions. Uh, that was also made by a Stony Brook University student. Uh, we have Firefox made by a high school student and WordPress also made um, by undergraduate college students. So the point why I, I like to highlight these is because um, think about your undergraduate life. It is a unique opportunity because there is a pairing up of your work, your, your academic requirements and what could potentially be your long-term career goals. You work on projects which, which could very well, if you are so inspired, turn into companies, turn into technologies that you could license and sell. And we have students do this all the time. We've had Students from this university found game studios. Students from the university uh, found companies that sell software to hospitals. Um, and I think one of the really uh, great things is when you're an undergraduate student and you work on a project that you enjoy, you can then continue to work on it. You can make it better. You can make it into a real product and you can feel inspired to do so. And you can even pick projects in your undergraduate courses or in your research uh, that do so. I have a student right now, Saranj, and he is working on a, a program called Notice. And he competes in uh, Rubik's Cube competitions. You should see him do a Rubik's Cube. In fact, you could probably find it on YouTube. He can do a Rubik's Cube in like four seconds. It's frightening to watch. And he goes to all these competitions all over the Northeast. So he wrote software and I was the advisor on this project basically for running these competitions for the people who were running, administering the competitions and for the people who are competing in it because they have all different categories and, and things like that. And now he has people in Australia using it, people in this country using it, people in Australia using it. And he's hoping to get people in other types of competitions to use it as well. So think of undergraduate education as an opportunity to create something that other people will use, which is a very exciting sort of an idea, I think, right? Uh, in fact, right here, we have Jason and Charlie working on some technologies that we hope will be used uh, by others in the near or maybe not so near future, depending on um, how one of our grant applications go, grant proposals go. Anyway. 
I know some people might tell you, you know, computer science is a lot of work. It's hard or, or whatever. Me personally, I have wanted to learn the Spanish language since I was a child. I'm still not there. So I find that hard. I'm not great at memorization. Um, I tried to learn Korean. I spent a year in Korea. That was hard. I, my brain, for whatever reason, or maybe it's just what I enjoy, is not great at memorization. I remember not being very good at biology for a similar reason. Um, I much more enjoy having a set of problem solving skills and then applying those skills to problems. Um, and it is a lot of work, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it is work, uh, but many times the things that are a lot of work are the things that are worth doing, right? I mean, you wanna, you wanna set yourself with, a skills, with skills that are in demand and that um, you can create great things with, okay? So, I certainly encourage undergraduate students to participate in undergraduate research. Now we have something on campus called VIP with the College of Engineering. And this is essentially called vertigrated, uh, Vertical Integrated Projects, which lets undergraduate students work on a research project over multiple years. And I'm gonna tell you about some of the projects that I'm currently supervising uh, under the VIP banner. But there are many other projects as well. Just so you know, this, uh, these slides are available to everyone. You can certainly access them if you like. We'll provide a, um, them to you at the end, give you a link for them. And understand that these are all VIP teams from various people around campus. There are many others as well, but I chose um, a subset that relate particularly to computer science. Um, just for example, just to give you a little Example, Polytech here, which is run by one of my friends and colleagues, Rob Kelly in the computer science department. Uh, he has a team that examines electoral data, right? And the idea is writing software that will um, learn information about um, electoral tendencies and, and geography-based um, information about these things. But there are many, many other types of research projects for undergraduate students. Understand that these are all for undergraduate students, okay? As far as my own projects are concerned, again, you can access these on my homepage. These are the ones that I currently have active. I'm supervising nine different projects, which is probably too many, uh, but it's something that I really enjoy. And just to quickly go through again, if you go to my homepage, you can visit many of these sites, because many of them are kind of, they have prototypes or they're in process. I think Regiovinco is maybe the closest to being done. We're hoping to have that done at the end of the semester. But anyway, these are the types of projects that I'm interested in. I want you to understand all of the people listed here, they're all undergraduate students, with the exception of faculty. On this VENT application, we have two faculty here, and we have somebody who works at Twitch. Uh, so. Eddie Chan and Dr. Schwartz, they're both Stony Brook faculty. Mark LeKay, he's an alumni who was my student, but now works at Twitch. Oh, and there's one other, one other alumni, Brian Yang here. He was our student and now he works at Amazon. So most of the projects here are under, are nearly all the people here are undergraduate students. You'll see Eddie Chan also on multiple projects. She is my research partner on many things. She's from biomedical engineering and we collaborate on our own VIP group, which we call BEAR, Bioengineering Education, Application and Research. Uh, we work in technologies to benefit biomedical research and things like that. Anyway, I'll just quickly go through these projects and then I'll answer the questions that you have. So Algorithms for Games is essentially an application for learning about Al um, algorithms that are used in game engines and things like that. It has different interactive demos that you can use. And the idea is that we have students adding these things over time, more and more algorithms that are interesting and used by game engines. We have the animated poser. This is something that's ongoing. It's for making 2D characters, 2D sprites for 2D games. We have the lab simulation builder. This is what Jason is working on. Uh, this is essentially a platform and application for doing virtual labs for biomedical engineering students. Regiovinco is a game. It is a geography-based game. It is getting near to completion. 
still has a lot of things that have to be fixed, lots of data that has to be fixed, but we are in uh, the home stretch, hopefully. It's been years actually working on this product. Uh, Starring is a movies type of a trivia game, all right? Vent was an application that we made for the university hospital. And basically this was to help doctors figure out how to convert certain machineries to be uh, certain uh, devices to be respirators for COVID patients. So this was done essentially as an emergency because we had so many COVID patients at one time uh, back in the spring at the hospital. And so we made this application to help doctors uh, learn how to use certain equipment that they weren't accustomed necessarily to using. We have a wireframer app. This is an application for doing something called mockups, which is for making user interface approximations for the purpose of designing programs. Wolfie Tools is something Charlie is working on. Wolfie Tools is basically the backbone of many of these different technologies that we're making here. In fact, it is for Animated Poser and for Wireframer in particular. So basically it provides a lot of the, oh, and uh, Lab Simulation Builder also. So it provides a lot of the common functionality between all these web applications um, and does a lot of the difficult things as far as security is concerned, database access and things like that. And then finally, there is a game engine that I am designing with a student named Joe Weaver uh, called Wolfie2D. All right. Again, I'm just going to quickly, let me just quickly do this. I'm going to jump over to my browser and hopefully you can see, let's see, which one is it? Here we are. So this is my homepage. If you're interested in any of these projects, you can click on research and you can find them all here. Again, most of them have, Vent has an, a link, all right? And I mean, this is an application used by the hospital for different things re re relating to how to use certain equipment. Uh, Regio Vinco has a link. Algorithms for Games has a link. Like a number of these different things have links. Um, let's see, you know, just for example, for just for doing collision tests and things like that. Um, so these are the types of projects that I work on. But of course, there are many, many, many others. There, there's a crossover here between games, but also things like biomedical engineering. Okay. Uh, finally, I would also encourage you again to go to the game. Uh, site. This is our game programming competition site, and you can read all about last year. These were the games that were made last year. You can also click on them and play them, all right? And you can see all the judges that we had last year who are now professionals out in industry. Um, and then we have at the bottom, we have a set of applications of games that were made by our alumni um, who are now in industry. So, That's all I have as far as a presentation is concerned. So I'll now answer any questions you may have and I'll funnel questions to Charlie and Jason. So we have one here. If interested in cybersecurity is the best major in computer science. So the answer to that is maybe. Certainly we have courses specifically in cybersecurity. In fact, we have a cybersecurity specialization. In fact, if you go to, you just go to Google and find it. Uh, cyber security uh, specialization Stony Brook and computer security specialization. Here we go. So this is for undergraduate students. You can find the core requirements and the electives. And certainly we have a breadth of faculty who specialize in computer security and work with that um, specialization, all right? Now there are some universities that offer degrees specifically in cybersecurity. So there are some universities like that, uh, but our cybersecurity program is within the requirements of a computer science degree. So you're getting a computer science degree just like everyone else, but with an expertise in cybersecurity, all right? It was mentioned that there is overlap between these fields, but I wonder how much leeway and flexibility is offered regarding switching between the computer science and computer engineering major. 
I'm somewhat conflicted as things stand as both appeal to me considerably. Well, that's a little bit tricky. Um, switching between majors within the College of Engineering is doable. Uh, I have to admit we don't have that many students who switch from outside of the College of Engineering, but within the College of Engineering, we do have students who switch between majors. And to do so, you have to earn a certain uh, grade point average in introductory courses in computer science in order to switch in. But you have to be a little bit careful with that. Uh, you really, as best as you can, you want to apply to the program that you are going to want to be in. There is the ability to switch between majors, but again, there's no guarantee that you can do that, and it's dependent upon the grades that you get in introductory courses, right? In which facilities would computer science majors be able to do research um, at Stony Brook, and what benefits would these labs provide? So this is a there's a broad answer to this. I mean, we participate in research with lots of different uh, groups. Um, again, I deal with the campus entities, so the biomedical engineering department and the hospital, things like that. We've had many students do projects with the hospital, all right? Hospitals use lots and lots and lots of software for different purposes. We also have a relationship though with uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory, so I've had students do research there and actually then end up working there. Same is true with Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, in particular with uh, bioinformatics and things like that. Uh, but we have faculty in our department who have their own research labs. And if you go to our, there is a CSC 475, uh, 475, is that what it is? No, CSC 487 Stony Brook. Uh, if you go to that, you can find some of the varied um, things that people will do. And there's actually, this is essentially an undergraduate research course uh, that students can take and do research in all kinds of different ways. And all of our department lab environments are all eligible for that. What percentage of students are admitted directly to the CS department? I will defer on this question can admissions answer that question for us? Because I don't know the answer. Jonathan? It varies each cycle. So there's not really a, a hard percentage. Um, I will say for what it's worth, typically an admissible student that's directly admitted into the computer science program is gonna have a high school GPA on a 100 point scale of say a 95 or a 96 or higher. And when we are requiring SATs, typically that SAT score will be a 1450 or higher. Um, but just to manage expectations on the front end, our computer science program is among uh, the most competitive programs that we offer. So um, even students with the academic profile I just mentioned uh, occasionally are denied just based on space availability. Now we do have two students here who took different routes. We have Jason who was a direct admit, and we have Charlie who transferred into the university. Charlie, you wanna talk a little bit about your experience transferring in? Sure, so I was at the University at Buffalo for about two years. And when I transferred in, I had done pretty much all of the prereq courses. Um, and I transferred in with a, a GPA of 3.7, I believe. And even then it was still a very, um, well, that's a humble brag. It was a very I'm sorry. Keep going. <laughs> they, the school did not uh, admit me until about two weeks before the semester started. So even, you know, it can it could be fairly competitive if you're coming in as a transfer. Uh, I think if you start at high at the high school level and you have uh, AP classes and done and stuff, anecdotally, it seems like that's a bit of an easier way to get in. I also transferred in the spring semester, and I think that that probably is a little bit easier relative to fall because all the high school students are also coming in during the fall as well. I have another answer for the previous question, by the way, about research facilities that I forgot to mention. We do here on campus, uh, we have a research facility called CWIT, the Center for Excellence in Wireless and Information Technology. And I've had many students do research down there over the years. So that's a facility that um, 
gives internships to many students. In fact, there are multiple companies down there like Softion, which is filled with Stony Brook University computer science department people. Um, so that's another facility that I forgot to mention. Again, cybersecurity, I guess um, in terms of flexibility, so the flexibility in a computer science major. Now, if you're interested in going to law school, I, I have had students, one guy, Chris, I can remember, uh, who is now a lawyer. Um, I don't know what he did during an undergraduate career that necessarily benefited. And I'll be honest, I don't know if he's working specifically in legal issues relating to software. I mean, one would assume that there are many people who are lawyers who, who do that based on all of the licensing agreements I have to agree to and how long they are. Uh, but I don't know that much about that. Um, we do not have a law school here at Stony Brook University, um, if that is something that matters to you. But certainly cybersecurity, I mean, again, we have a number of security courses in our department and we have within the computer science major, we have a computer security specialization. Now, if I wanted to pursue a career in data science, does SBU provide a track for that in its CS major? Again, the answer is yes, we have a data science track. We definitely do. We have two upper division courses in data science. We are also starting a new master's degree in data science. So uh, some students are looking forward to that. Uh, think of a master's degree as becoming an expert in a particular field of computer science for industry, right? Um, and then a PhD is for academia, typically. But so we have an undergraduate track for data science, and then we have a master's degree program specifically for data science as well. Let's see, do you know any companies that offer jobs based on robotics? Uh, I have one student who's working in robotics out in California for Google. I mean, certainly they do robotics, have a lot of students who work at Google, right? They are one of the primary recruiters here on campus for us. Same with Amazon. Um, I don't off the top of my head know. I mean, I used to know one that did it here in New York, but I don't know if they do that anymore. Um, actually, there's one out in, um, there's something called Zebra Technology here on Long Island, uh, where one of my students does an internship there. And he's working on automated systems with some robotics uh, for automatically scanning products in a warehouse and things like that. Um, so let's see. Are you required to pick a CS concentration or you can you pick a general track? Yes, most people I think uh, do the general track. All right, most people, um, if they're gonna choose a, a particular track, maybe they wait till grad school. Uh, but we do have a, a number of students who will pick a specialization while undergraduate students, people who are particularly interested in a field. How many students are in the computer science department? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe the undergraduate population is somewhere around 900, 1,000. It kind of fluctuates to some degree, but that's the number of undergraduate students. Um, and certainly we've had a surge in demand in recent years. And we don't honestly, I think, know what's going to happen moving forward. Everybody is a little unsure what's going to happen moving forward uh, in terms of this um, inoculation cycle with the COVID um, crisis here. So we, we are not sure how it might affect us, but we, I think in recent years, we would say somewhere around 900 to 1,000 students in our undergraduate program. Um, our graduate program has, I think our master's degree program has typically had somewhere around 400 or 500 students. And our PhDs are much less than that, of course. Will there be too many students learning computer science? And will it be difficult to find a job a few years down the road? Uh, I would say the skills in computer science are in demand everywhere. I mean, I'm not just saying that because of my position here. Uh, we, we get people get hired with computer science degrees by Wall Street companies and things like that. And the reason is because the ability to do this sort of work is applicable to many other uh, types of jobs. It's much, it's much harder, much rarer for 
uh, people to be hired for programming jobs these days. I know it used to happen more often, but these days without a computer science degree, that's kind of your first foot in the door. And again, you know, if you look at labor department numbers and whatnot, there is projected growth in the need for programmers. I mean, the more technology you build, the more programmers you need to maintain it, to update it, to improve it, and so on and so forth. I would also add that one thing that you, that is kind of like a soft skill in a way that you get from doing a program like this is that you learn a lot of uh, problem solving skills that you kind of don't really get if you are taking some other sort of non-technical uh, major. Like I was an English major before I decided to focus on computer science and uh, that was something that became very clear to me as I went deeper in that there was a way of thinking and approaching problems that I was figuring out from these kinds of courses, from the kinds of problems you face in computer science that you don't really get elsewhere, unless you're like a math major or something like that. I will say, um, you know, we do have in our computer science major, you're getting a general, we have general education requirements as well. And so you have to take writing courses and you have to take a natural science series of courses and you have to take humanities courses and things like that. So you're exposed to those other disciplines as well. And um, we have, you know, certainly a large university here. I mean, we have what, somewhere around 25,000 students. And so there's a wealth, again, a wealth of varied courses across the campus. Uh, to choose from, really. A lot of interesting courses in, in various majors that meet general education requirements as well. Are you required to pick a CS concentration? Okay, we answered that one already, right? You're not required. We have how beneficial will it be for a computer engineering major to minor in computer science? I would say very. Um, in fact, many of our computer engineering majors at this university end up working in software. Um, I can think of many right off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> in fact, one funny thing is that one of our alumni, John Hennessy, he won the top award in computer science last, last no, two years ago. Um, John Hennessy was the president of Stanford University, and then he was uh, the head of Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google. So he was the parent company of, uh, he was the CEO of, of Alphabet at the time, and he won the Turing Award. And I mention him because he was a computer science major, but he created MIPS, which is an assembly level, uh, an assembly language, which he won the Turing Award with, along with his partner. And um, it, it's interesting because he was a computer science major specializing in systems, which is kind of the hardware end of things in part. Um, so there is definitely overlap and we do get computer engineering people who have careers in software. Let's see, next one. What job offers are usually offered to CS majors at get a wide array? Uh, certainly we have two computer science job fairs here a year, uh, one in the spring, one in the fall, and students go and bring their resumes and it has produced many jobs at many different places. I can tell you, uh, I mean, we've had students go work at the national, uh, <laughs> Science Foundation for the NSA, for the government in all sorts of different places. Uh, go work at universities. I had a student this summer worked uh, an internship at a, a Navy research lab, had students go on to work at Microsoft and Riot Games and um, 2K Sports, which is another game studio. Uh, go work at um, Microsoft, uh, Apple and Amazon and I mean, every software company you can imagine uh, students graduate and go to work at with undergraduate degrees, okay? Those students that I listed back in my presentation, those were all undergraduate students. So undergraduate students uh, certainly have opportunities for all these very different uh, companies and different opportunities. Are there any cybersecurity related clubs? And if so, what is the name? That's a good question. We have a club called the Stony Brook Computing Society, and they have a special interest group from time to time in cybersecurity. 
Uh, but there are always people in that group, the Stony Brook Computing Society, which has been along for decades and decades. I'm the advisor for it. And there is always a group of student, students particularly interested in cybersecurity. So uh, you will find like minds there. And there's from time to time, it depends on if there's a, enough students interested in a given semester and leadership for it. There's a special interest group for that. Let's see, uh, two-part question, is grading on the curve? And the answer to that question is uh, very likely, yes, it depends. I mean, it depends on the course, it depends on the department to some degree, but to some degree, you know, yes. I mean, certainly in courses that I teach, we have distributions and things like that. What percentage of students have 3.2 grade point averages? The answer to that question, I have no idea, honestly. Um, anybody else have any idea? Do we know percentages of students that have percentage of a given grade point average? I don't know. Definitely not high in CS. <laughs> <laughs> I would say anecdotally, the average grade is a B Anecdotally, or B I don't know if we want to give it. The anecdotally is an F. No, no, no. <laughs> it's a B or a B minus, I would say, for most courses. Um, Usually no, B minus. I would say the, the introductory courses you get tend to get lower grades grades that you won't necessarily find in the upper division courses. I mean, the idea uh, is once <laughs> students get into the upper division courses, students have invested a lot of time and energy and they're skilled to the point where they can generally do the work of those upper division courses. There are some struggles with, with 18 year old students, honestly, and undergraduate students uh, in undergraduate courses that they're first taking. Um, and, you know, you always want to be careful of that. I mean, Many times for students, the, the most dangerous, perilous period for their academic career is their first semester, their first year, uh, because they have a whole new sense of freedom, especially if they're living on campus. And uh, they're in a much larger world, of course, and the standards at the university are very high and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to jump in here to uh, tell everyone we're going to wrap it up in a few minutes, but uh, we do have some questions specific to the students. So for Jason and Charlie, real quick, a um, couple of folks here would just like to know generally, what's your favorite part about being a computer science student? Jason? I, I guess my favorite part is being able to create something that has some actual use. And I, I for computer science, it's more easier to create something with the knowledge you've just learned, at least for me specifically. Um, but there's a real impact in what you you do when you create something or you program something. And when you see someone use your application and then they repeatedly use it because it's useful, it, it really becomes, uh, I guess, an inspiring point for me. A source of pride. Yeah. And Jason makes a very good point, which is that you can make something yourself. You can make it on your own computer. I do not buy an expensive computer. I bring my computer everywhere. I spill coffee on it at Starbucks. I leave it on the train, right? So I generally do not buy an expensive computer, uh, but I can do all the work that I need to do on it. And with your average laptop these days, you can do all the work uh, necessary for an undergraduate program and also for creating a whole new set of technologies and even starting a company. You don't need some advanced lab with expensive equipment or anything. I would say that there's, you know, I'm someone who grew up using computers my whole life and there's a level of appreciation and understanding you get with this thing that you use every single day. Once you start to study how it's working and how it's managing to do all of these things for you. And it's, it's, there's, some, there's something immensely gratifying about being able to look at a computer and to start to understand the ways in which it is handling all of these intense tasks that you're throwing it at and also the ways in which it's like not working and how you'd be able to look at it and say like, okay, well, I would change this and I would fix that. And I wonder if this is a bug here or something like that. Also just to echo Jason's sentiment of the being able to like make something and then look at it and say like, okay, that's a thing that I made and it works is a fantastic feeling. Yeah. And Charlie worked on that project. He helped with the project in the hospital 
So to think that maybe the work that Charlie did has helped save lives at the hospital in the COVID crisis, I mean, that has to be a gratifying sort of maybe. thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Next question for students. Do we have another one? Sure. Yeah, I've got one more. Um, and this may just be a matter of preference, uh, but we'll see uh, what Charlie and Jason have to say. Uh, should students buy a Mac or a Windows computer? Honestly, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> That's all I could say. Um, I have both a MacBook and a Windows computer. Um, I switch between both, but I just use which whichever is faster. <laughs> At least, the, yeah. The only thing that I would say is that there are a couple of courses where you either need to or is very helpful to be able to load a virtual machine of a Linux distribution. I don't know what the level of support for virtualization is on Macs, uh, maybe it's completely fine. And in that case, I would say, again, it really doesn't matter, but that would really be the only thing that I would uh, I would watch out for. Oh, I would, I would say... like to add, <laughs> sorry, one more no, go thing. Go ahead, Jason, go ahead. Um, I remember I took a programming course for uh, iOS development. If you're ever gonna go into iOS development, you probably should get a Mac <laughs> because there is almost no upset exception to um, what OS you need in order to do programming for iOS, you only need a Mac or you, 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 om you require a Mac for that. Yeah. And I would say the inverse then goes also if you want to make Windows applications. Now, right. keep in mind that I don't know that there's a single class in the department that really requires you to make Mac applications or iOS applications or Windows applications. We certainly spend lots of time making Java applications, making Python applications, and maybe most of all, maybe even making web applications. Uh, certainly the World Wide Web now is uh, able to run applications with backend systems, right? I mean, you can use uh, Google Sheets for your spreadsheet through the web so much of the software that we write is really web-based, which, which means it can be a lot of JavaScript. Um, and then the back end can be all sorts of different things, Java, Python, and, or .NET, or whatever. For the, uh, for the people in the chat who are interested in making games, however, um, I would absolutely recommend going with a Windows system, because then you can use Visual Studio. And Visual Studio has the best visual debugger currently available, uh, I would say. it's. It's like a really weird kind of like small point, but a really good debugger is a really fantastic thing. And Visual Studio's debugger is phenomenal. Yeah, and I think generally speaking, Windows is much more of a gaming platform. So for those interested in games, certainly I would agree with that. All right, and before we wrap it up, my last point for the folks here uh, that are considering applying to computer science. Um, we just wanna make sure that it's very clear that if you're considering computer science and maybe another major, um, definitely apply for computer science because it's much more difficult to switch into computer science than it is to switch out of computer science. Um, the other thing too is if you believe you might be uh, below the academic profile and you have a better chance of getting in for one major and you think you're going to try and switch into computer science when you get here, um, it's highly unlikely that that would be possible. So again, we recommend that you apply specifically for computer science if that's what you're considering, um, because we don't want you to get here and then potentially be stuck and unable to switch into computer science. So uh, we just wanna stress that and make that clear given the sheer volume of computer science applications and how competitive the program truly is uh, to be admitted. Um, but that's by no means in an effort to discourage you, but of course, just to manage expectations on the front end. Um, so I'd like to take the time now to, uh, again, thank you, thank Richard, Jason, and Charlie for uh, spending an hour or so with us and, and really helping us to better explain the opportunities available to computer science students here at Stony Brook. Um, for those of you that may not have had your questions answered, feel free to email us at enroll at stonybrook.edu uh, to follow up. Also, we will be sending a follow-up email after the event with a link to this recording. Um, so if you wanted to catch up on anything that you may have missed throughout the, uh, the hour here, uh, you will have that opportunity. It'll also be available on our YouTube channel. Um, so thank you again, and uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.
Richard, just a reminder, the only way for it to, to close out uh, would be for you to close it as the host. Sure. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, See you, everybody. Guys. Bye.